Thank you for joining the Marco Island Historical Society tonight. I'm thrilled to be the host of this program, which kicks off our sophomore season of the popular Zoom In series. Mm -hmm. So joining us tonight from St. Petersburg is our guest speaker, Art Levy. Art's currently the associate editor of Florida Trend. And over his career, he's won over 25 awards for his work in newspapers and magazines. His first book, Made in Florida, which is the focus of our talk tonight, um, reflects his work over the past decade, traveling across the state and interviewing notable Floridians for Florida Trends feature called Icon. So we are gonna have put Art on the spot at the end and have a little interview session. So any questions you have for Art during the program, please type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll make sure that uh, he answers those for you. Also, I'll be monitoring the chat box. So any questions you have for me or comments or kind words for our speaker, please type those in too. So I'm gonna pass it over to Art. Thank you so much. All right, well, thank you so much. And thank you so much for the Marco Ireland Historical Society for asking me to be here. Um, I didn't realize that people would be here from different places because I focused the people we, I, I've interviewed over 130 people so far for this I, or for this icon feature for Florida Trend Magazine. And so for tonight, I've tried to pick people that are um, not just have lived through a lot of history, but live near near Marco Island in Southwest Florida, you know, Naples. We got somebody from Immokalee. So hopefully everyone finds this of interest. Um, I'll, I'll tell you first quickly who I am. Um, I've, I've been a journalist uh, since, believe it or not, 1984. Um, I've worked for newspapers and Florida Trend for about a little bit more than a decade. Uh, the early part of my career, I did a lot of hard news reporting uh, for newspapers. And that eventually evolved into writing feature stories, which evolved into what I do now, which is essentially travel the state, um, interviewing uh, we call them icons. They're, they're just basically prominent people who've been successful. Some you might know, a lot of them you don't. They're just, they're just really, really good at what they do. And so we, we feature them. Um, as like it was said, the, the book is on display. It's called Made in Florida. And uh, that was published in 2019. Now the, the icon feature works a little differently than a typical profile because it's told entirely in the words of the interviewee. So essentially, I, I, I speak to the people um, for two or three hours sometimes, ask them a bunch of questions, and I transcribe their answers. And um, hopefully those answers uh, are arranged in a way that help tell their story. And in, and in doing so, kind of tell a story of Florida too. Um, so that's what I'll be reading today. I have, uh, I, I settled on about 14 people, and I'll be reading their quotes. And uh, I'll get started. The first one is named Louise Gopher, who's the, uh, I like to start with this person because she's lived a lot of Florida history. And so um, um, I, I traveled to um, the, the Lake Okeechobee area and met her. And she was wonderful. It was actually the Brighton Seminole Indian Reservation. And we spoke in uh, about uh, 2014, which is about two years before she died. <clears throat> and here's how it starts out. I was born in an orange grove because that's where my parents were working at the time. So that's where they established their camp. I was born in a chicky. Sometimes we would live in a trailer or some other structure. I must have been almost finished with school before I actually moved into a house with all the comforts. Indoor bathrooms, indoor showers, running water. When I was a kid, I only spoke my native language, Creek. No English. I guess my father knew a little to get by at work, and my mother probably did too. But I didn't learn English until I started going to school. Um, I was the first female member of the Seminole tribe to earn a bachelor's degree. I lived in Fort Pierce, and a junior college had been built, Indian River Community College, and I finished two years there and then went to Florida Atlantic University. After a while, people kept saying, she's been going to school forever. 
but I knew the education was helping. Uh, growing up, we lived in camps near Fort Pierce with a lot of other families living nearby. My parents did agricultural work. It seemed like every evening there was a big bonfire or campfire and we sat around and that's when you listen to the stories and legends and learn the history. The mascot thing has been a big issue for some teens, but I don't mind FSU's mascot. The outfits and everything are correct. There's nothing cartoonish or ugly. I think FSU understands our history. We have two dialects in the Seminole tribe. It's like having two languages. One is the Creek language and the other is, is Miccosukee. I speak Creek. The languages are so different, a lot of people who understand one can't understand the other. My grandfather, DeSoto Tiger, he was killed when my mother was two weeks old. He's a history story. Did you ever hear of the John Ashley gang? They ran up and down the South Florida coast in the 1910s to about the 1920s. They were outlaws. Where my grandfather fits in, he was their first victim. He was a fur trapper and was, and was taking some otter hides down to Miami in 1911. John Ashley killed him and took the hides. Gopher is a Native American name, I guess. I don't know what it stems from. My sister's name was Smith. In fact, we had brothers with different last names, Frank Shore, Oscar Hall, Sam Jones. They just gave us names. Okay, and, and that's Louise Gopher. And the next person is Patrick Smith, who um, I hope many of you know from his book, A Land Remembered. Um, I interviewed him in, two, in the summer of 2013, and it was a special interview for me um, because I was able to go to his home in Merritt Island. Um, and since it was summer, my, son, my two sons came along with me. Um, and they had both... One of them had read the book and the other one was maybe a little bit too small to have read it, but he, but he read it later. And Mr. Smith was not in great shape. He was actually in a hospital bed that had been set up in his living room, but he was so gracious and his wife was so, so kind to my sons. And she gave him cookies and soda. And, and uh, as far as his writing goes, it's amazing how many people I speak to have read A Land Remember and were touched by it. Um, it's, it's basically, considered the great historical novel about Florida. And I think it's a good book for, for new residents to, lead, to, to read and also all of us to read. So here's a little bit from, from him. <clears throat> Marjorie Kidden Rawlings, I wrote my master's thesis in college on her. She was a tremendous writer, but her novels usually covered one year and that's it. I wrote A Land Remembered because I wanted to try to picture life here in Florida over a long period of time. I don't think anyone had else had attempted a novel that covered more than 100 years of Florida. I was what was called a moonlight writer. That's some guy who works all day and then works at night. It was a hard way to write. You give up a lot. You have to have the urge. Um, his other job was he sort of worked for a, the community college near where he lived. If I could get out of this bed, I'd like to write a novel about the Indian River Lagoon. It's a waterway that they say is dying. If it would actually die, it would affect not just the wildlife, not just the fish, but everyone. This is a little line about uh, when he worked someplace else <clears throat> in Mississippi. I met James Meredith a long time ago. I was working for the University of Mississippi in public relations, and he was the first black student. <clears throat> I escorted him to class for the two or three weeks until things settled down. It was an unusual time, I'll say that. My main duty was just to keep the reporters from following him, trying to interview him or go into the classroom. There were a lot of unpleasant things that happened, and I just prefer not to dwell on them or even try to remember them. <clears throat> I went down through the Big Cypress Swamp one time and saw all these little chicky huts. It's very unusual to see people living that way. 
I had an idea I wanted to write something set down there close to the Everglades. So I was just looking around and that turned into my novel Forever Island. You know, he's actually written like three or four other novels besides A Land Remembered. In the pioneer days, family was everything. Nothing mattered but family. Everybody wanted to do their part of the work. It's not that way anymore. That's one of the things that young people who have read A Land Remembered question me about. Why does everybody have to die? They don't ever want anyone to die, but people do die, especially in pioneer Florida. Buddy Epson was a big fan of A Land Remembered. He was, that's the actor who was in the Beverly Hillbillies. Buddy Epson was a big fan of A Land Remembered. We talked by, tel by telephone about it several times. And then one day he just flew here from California, landed in Orlando, rented a car and drove over here. He wanted to talk about everything in it. My wife Iris took a picture of him, but she cut off the top of his head. He was tall. <clears throat> Researching the book, I had to read about a dozen books, I guess, about specific things that happened in Florida, like that great freeze of 1895. You just can't dream that up, you know. I had a lot of old timers, old pioneer people tell me stories. I'd sit down and talk to them. They tell me about living through those swarms of mosquitoes and alligators and all those kinds of things. A land remembered is not based on a real family. It's based on a dozen real families. This, this, this quote just shows how, how seriously he took his research. An article in the Miami Herald got me interested in migrant, migrant workers. They had arrested one of these independent contractors for enslaving people, and no one would testify against him in court. When I was researching Angel City, the novel I wrote about a migrant family, I went down to Homestead and posed as a migrant and lived in the camps. I picked tomatoes and squash and all that stuff. I had to know what it was like. All right. And then on to Roland Martin who I, I picked him because he lives in Naples. And he's, he's also was a real, he's a real fun guy to talk to. He's a professional fisherman and uh, has an interesting life story. A lot of the people when I pick them, if some people often ask this, I, I, I pick people not just because they're prominent, but, but because they have an interesting story. Okay, here's a little bit from Roland Mark. And, and once again, I'm not reading all the quotes, just, just, a, just a, a touch, because we don't have time. If I could, I'd, I'd read all the whole book. Mom and dad considered me the black sheep of the family because I wasn't in a real profession. My mom was a school teacher and, and she wanted me to become something other than a fisherman. And my dad, he was a hydraulic engineer and he couldn't stand the thought of me being a fisherman. He didn't think I'd amount to much. Ted Williams was a good fisherman. That's the old baseball player. Um, we fished together and he'd ask a lot of questions. He would look at you and make some stupid insulting comment and then you had to come back with an insult of your own. He liked that. He was forever getting himself in hot water messing with people. I don't know if you guys know Ted Williams, but he had a re reputation as a really, really surly guy. Every fisherman out there on the lake is gonna have some lucky opportunity come by, but half of them aren't gonna recognize the luck. And half of them aren't gonna capitalize on the luck. Really good fishermen capitalize on those opportunities. Right now, one of the issues that's kind of grating on me a bit is weed control. What happens traditionally in Lake Okeechobee, for example, is you spray to control some of the weeds like hyacinths that get in the waterways and plug up locks. So they have a spray program, but now they're spraying too much. The lake was really healthy, say three or four years ago, and the great and and with a great weed cover but now i can now i can take you out and show you acre after acre burned up from the chemicals they're spraying not only from airboats but airplanes too it's overkill overkill a lot of the food chain relies on those weeds and that's all from him uh the next person is george allen George Allen was the first uh, African-American person to graduate from UF, University of Florida's law school. 
and uh, he did that in 1962. Also a very, very tough person. I was born in Sanford, Florida, which used to be totally which used to be a totally segregated community. I was home for a visit and went to the public library to do some research for a project, and I was told that I couldn't come into the white library. I just walked past the lady and found the books I needed and sat down. They whispered and pointed, but nobody beat me up, so I did my research. That's how I grew up. I experienced people being beat up and mistreated because they were black. It was an injustice that the Florida Supreme Court, all of those white justices kept denying Virgil Hawkins the right to go to the University of Florida. Virgil kind of made a deal that he would give up his right to go if they would admit other blacks. So Virgil sacrificed for me. I started working in the fields when I was about 10 years old. The white farmers would close down the black schools in the winter because Sanford was a farming area, mostly celery at that time and all of us Blacks who were able-bodied had to work in the fields. People were arrested for not working. <clears throat> when I arrived at the, at the University of Florida, they wouldn't let me live at married student housing because we were Black. I would receive telephone calls saying, N-word, N-word, we're gonna kill you. And I tell them to go to hell. My dad gave me a rifle and said, if they come to your house, shoot them. I had young kids. So I taught them how to shoot. I made it known that I don't believe in nonviolence like Martin Luther King. If you bother me, I'll be violent. A friend of mine, Percy Lee, we were working in the fields cutting celery along with other youngsters. The overseer, the straw boss, his name was Red Tile. He had a bad attitude and he hated black folk. He and Percy got into an argument about how Percy was packing the celery. He said Percy sassed him and he said no one could talk to a white person that way. So we got a machete knife and he said he was going to kill Percy. Percy's mother and my mother and father and a lot of the other grown ups told him no you won't. They circled Percy and I was in there with him. We had to get per Percy out of the field because the guy really was going to kill him. <clears throat> I was admitted to Harvard and the University of California at Berkeley, but I'm a native Floridian, and I felt that somebody had to integrate the University of Florida. The racist told me I didn't belong, belong there, and I'd never graduate. I got into one or two fights with students who were disrespectful, but I never considered quitting. I made it known that you're not going to run me away. You're not going to scare me. I'm going to outstudy all of you, and I'm going to graduate. Um, this, uh, this final quote a reference to another historical event that happened in Florida way back when. In Groveland, Florida, my wife and I built a log cabin. The sheriff who used to be up there, Willis McCall, he was a really racist guy who was involved in that Groveland case. He killed a prisoner and shot another one in the back. Anyway, that was the county where I built the log cabin. And my dad told me I was crazy and tried to talk me out of it. But I said, hey, they don't do anything like that now. It's better now. And later they burned my cabin. And the sad part was they knew who burned it and never arrested anybody. That was the late 18 or 1980s, early 1990s. All right. Now on to Joanne Morgan. Um, she also was a first, she, she also made some history. She was the first female engineer to work in NASA's Kennedy Space Center. And during the Apollo 11 launch, she was the only woman working in what was then called the firing room. That's that room where everyone's sitting at their computers and, and, they're, and they're doing stuff. Um, I've interviewed uh, actually several astronauts, including uh, Edgar Mitchell, who was one of, one of the first Apollo astronauts. And, he was really interesting. He talked about how he felt the presence of aliens when he was in space. But I think Joanne Morgan might, might be my favorite space person that I interviewed. Let me get a little bit from her. This kind of tells you where she is coming from, even as a child. My favorite birthday present as a child 
was a chemistry set. The Apollo 11 launch was the first launch that I stayed in the fire room all the way through liftoff. I had moments where I felt like a goldfish in a bowl, even though I was surrounded by people. It was 500 men and me. In the fire room during, during the Apollo launch, we were on television all the time. And that television could be viewed in Houston or California or Washington or wherever. And so I did get obscene phone calls at my console and some other weird things happened because not every man who was there thought I deserved to be there or should be there because I was a woman. One of my jobs, one of my jobs, I was associate director for space shuttle upgrades and advanced development. The shuttles had been built and designed for either 20 years or 100 missions. Well, the 20 years was ending, but they had gotten near 100, they, they hadn't gotten near 100 missions, but the technology was old and the shuttles needed upgrades. They were like teenagers with bad skin who needed a brain transplant. All right. Um, the next person is Mike Owen, who I picked because he works at the, for many years, the Fakahachi Strand State Preserve. And uh, he's actually not in the book, so I'm just gonna read this off of, uh, off of, off of the paper. Um, but this is a really great place that's just not, not too far away from you guys. Um, now, Fakahachi is a swampland, a forested swamp, and it's also best known for being a place where you can see the uh, rare uh, ghost orchid. Owens calls it uh, America's Amazon. All right. You don't want to fall on a cypress knee. Those knees, some of them are sharp. You can get speared if you land the wrong way. Probably the most dangerous thing in the swamp is not an animal, not an alligator or a cottonmouth. It's a cypress knee. Back when I was a student at St. Pete Junior College, I saw the book, A Guide to Camping in Nature by Gerald Owen Grow. And his description in that book of Fakahachi was just really special. I figured, well, I've got to see this place. When I finally did, it was August, 1985, long before I went to work there and the mosquitoes were just crazy. I only lasted maybe five minutes running the path before the boardwalk started. And then I might've made it 100 yards down the boardwalk before I just was covered in mosquitoes. I was 25 and I was pretty tough, but the mosquitoes made me feel like a wimp. So I ran back, but I wasn't completely intimidated. The, the fact that I couldn't see it that first time only strengthened my resolve to return. The ghost orchid is my favorite orchid because it's the ultimate underdog. It's Cinderella. For 51 weeks, it's a bunch of roots on a tree. The ghost orchid doesn't even have leaves. She's just cleaning and doing all the work for 51 weeks, but like Cinderella, when the ghost orchid finally blooms for just seven to 10 days, it steals the ball. Nothing else comes close. In 2006, I met a woman by the name of Donna on a swamp walk that I was leading. It was exactly two years to the day that my first wife and I decided to split up. What really intrigued me about Donna was her eye for spotting orchids. I'm on this swamp walk and, she, and I had just shown the group a ghost orchid. I only show one ghost orchid per group. I know there was another gross, I knew there was another ghost orchid nearby and I didn't want to show that one to the group and Donna spotted it. Nobody ever finds ghost orchids on their first trip in the swamp. Your first time you're just overwhelmed. Everything's just green and it's, it's an Amazon jungle in there. Most people are just trying to take it all in and not fall in the water, but not Donna. Eventually we decided to get married and, and to have the ceremony in the swamp under the orchid that Donna found. Her orchid held the record for blooms. It bloomed in 2006 and every year after that until 2013 when it had a bud and it was gonna bloom again. Not, not long before the wedding, which was June 2013, the orchid was poached, scraped off the tree. So we, so we ended up getting married at the orchid I showed the group that first day.
I've been told that one of the best places to see a panther in South Florida is Jane's Scenic Drive in the Thakahatchee Strand. I've seen 23 pan panthers in my 25 years here. Thakahatchee is a Native American term that means either muddy water or crooked river or pulsing river. Another one is Hunter's Paradise. These are the four I've heard. Maybe all of them are right. To me though, Pakahachi means paradise. All right, so on to Blue Fulford, the next slide. And I wanted to give the commercial fishermen a, some, some time and not just the, the sport fishermen. I talked to Blue Fulford uh, in 2012, about three years before he died. Uh, I think he's a historical figure because he's so prominent in Florida's commercial fishing industry. He was based out of Cortez and is one of our state's greatest, or was one of our state's greatest commercial fishermen. All right. The fishing got kind of slack in the 1950s, in the late 1950s. And I went to work for a construction company for about six months. I got tired of that real quick. The only thing wrong with it, it wasn't fishing. I helped start the organized fishermen of Florida in 1967. And so I'd have to go up to Tallahassee and talk to the politicians about the laws they wanted to pass and all the areas they wanted to close off to commercial fishing. It was extremely frustrating. I was a greenhorn and didn't understand the didn't know the procedures and terminology they used. I didn't know what they were talking about. At a natural resources committee meeting up there, they asked me a question and I couldn't answer it. W.D. Childers was the chairman. After the meeting, I was sitting there feeling dumb and Bob Graham, who was on the committee, came over and kneeled down, and kneeled down in front of my chair and talked to me. He told me he would help me. <clears throat> All of the cartilage is gone, is gone from my shoulders. It's extremely painful. All the cartilage is gone out of my knee. I lost one leg, which doesn't hurt much sometimes. Phantom pain is what they call it. It's all from a lifetime of fishing. I lost my leg in 1987, September 14, and I went right back to fishing in a month. Somebody visited me in the hospital from the state wanted to know if I wanted any state help. And I said, no, I don't want any state help. I'm going back fishing. Here's the story about how he lost his, uh, lost his leg. <clears throat> I come down from the bridge. It wasn't my job to be where I was. I don't know what I was doing down there. I was standing by the, by the Tom weight, a 600 pound weight. I turned it loose and there she went on her way down, 600 pounds, and everything was fine. And then I moved over and the rope took a loop around my leg and jerked me up. I was hanging spread eagle. It had just about cut my leg off, cut everything except for the Achilles tendon. My son came down and was asking if he should cut me down. And I said, yeah, I guess. He took his pot and pocket knife and sliced the tendon. And that was a, a start to another phase of my life. Um, this is actually a recipe that he, that he passed along, which is, which is good. The best way, in my opinion, to eat mullet is just scale it, fillet it, and fry it with the skin on, flesh side down. Turn it when it's almost done and get that cornmeal crust where it's crunchy. That's good. I'll tell you what was a real shock to me when I would go to Tallahassee representing the commercial fishermen. I would sit up in the galley and watch the Senate or the House in action. They'd be debating a bill and there'd be three or four guys standing over in the corner, talking and joking, reading the funny papers, pinching the girls in the butt, doing everything they thought they could get away with. It bothered me. These people were supposed to be taking care of my livelihood. Okay. Greg Asbev. Greg, uh, he doesn't live too far from, from Marco Island and Dodge Island. That's why I wanted to include him. 
Uh, he works in Immokalee and is a co-founder of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers and the Fair Food Program. A few years back, he also won the MacArthur Genius Grant for his work trying to help farm workers. Here's a little bit from him. It's funny, if you listen to some of the things he says, it kind of harkens back to some of the stuff that George Allen said. In the early 1990s, when we first got here, the conditions in Immokalee were pretty shocking. You would see people getting beaten up out here in the parking lot on payday, on payday, and it wasn't, it was because they complained about their pay being short, or they complained about not getting paid at all. We realized that these conditions were not put here on two rock tablets, thus shall it always be. The conditions have reasons and that have roots that we could analyze, and we could see how we could change them. We started to ask, why are farm workers so poor? Why are farm workers so exploited? Why are they so abused? Why do they face so much violence at work? That was the beginning of our work. All this data was coming in and we could see that there were forces beyond the farm gate itself that actually influenced conditions on the farm. All those forces were the consolidated multi-billion dollar retail food companies that leveraged their buying and purchasing power to drive prices down. So if that power is the thing that's driving farm worker poverty, then we had to address that power in some way. We realize that these retail food companies don't care if farm workers protest, but they do care if, if consumers protest. We don't think of ourselves as the boss of the companies we buy from, but that's only because we abdicate our power. If we choose to use our power, we can demand that our tomatoes are picked by workers whose rights are not trampled on every day. The fair food agreements that we were finally able to achieve, first with Taco Bell, then with McDonald's, Burger King and Subway, and these other food service companies and supermarkets resulted in two simple things. They would pay a small premium, known as a penny more a pound, to help improve farm worker income. But much more importantly, the corporations would only buy from growers who comply with the human rights based code of conduct conduct that we developed. Wendy's and Publix and Kroger, those, there are a lot of companies that are still not part of this, but there are 14 companies now that are, including Whole Foods and Walmart. <clears throat> in, in Florida, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, farm labor was, in many cases, the compelled forced labor of African Americans in small towns throughout the spine of Florida where sheriffs would offer them essentially the opportunity to either go to jail or work in the fields. And anybody who rose up against it, anybody who tried to organize would be brutally dealt with. The only reason this changed was because at some point, agriculture was no longer the most important industry in the state. That became tourism. And tourism could not handle the connection to that kind of political reality. And so Tallahassee changed its stripes. I'm the son of Syrian Armenian, or, or I'm the son of a Syrian Armenian refugee immigrant. He was the son of a woman who was 13 years old when she survived the Armenian genocide. That was my grandmother. She survived after seeing virtually everyone in her family killed. The young women were taken on marches called caravans, death marches through Turkey and to, to Syria. She was sold by the Turks to the Kurds for two goats and a bale of hay and a gold coin. My father always insisted on the gold coin being part of the story. And his, his, his last quote um, makes reference to what George Allen said about the uh, Groveland situation. Have you read Devil in the Grove? Which was a book about that. You should. It should be required reading for all Florida high school students and for all Floridians. It talks about Florida, not the one we know today, but the roots of what we are today. Um, next up is Ed Price. And I, I wanted to include Ed Price because although you probably don't know who he is, he had a big part in the development of Southwest Florida. Among other things, he was a state senator in the late 1950s and early 60s. And uh, he helped bring 
I-75 down to Southwest Florida. Um, I, I interviewed him in 2010, a couple years before he died. Running for public office today is totally different. In my day, television was no big deal. You go door to door and meet people. You give speeches on the back of a flatbed truck in some parking lot somewhere, and all the people would sit in their cars and honk the horn if they liked you. One thing I've always been against is the, is the power that lobbyists have over our legislators. When I served, it was the time of the pork chop legislators. They were rural, very conservative, mainly from North Florida. The pork choppers had a blood oath that they would, that they would vote for any bill that, that, uh, that another pork chopper put in, period. There were just enough of us, they called us the lamb choppers, to uphold Governor Collins' vetoes of some of their legislation. People thought the pork choppers were a bunch of bad people. They were not. They were basically representing what they thought was best for their people. While I didn't agree with a lot of them, it wasn't like we couldn't do business. We joined hands and formed a coalition, for example, to build junior colleges throughout the state of Florida. We might fight each other on the floor, but afterward, we can go out to dinner. This one's a little bit, a little bit, uh, I guess, ironic. It must have been around 1963. I got the representatives from the counties affected to join with me and write a bill to appropriate $250,000 to go to work on this, on this one thing, red tide. The goal was to study red tide, find out what was causing it, and then do everything we could to prevent it. We passed the bill and the governor signed it. The marine biologist went to work, but the red tide, it still comes. We didn't have a four lane highway from Southwest Florida to Miami. There was no way to get there from here. The other coast already had a turnpike and we wanted to utilize some of those federal funds for Interstate 75. We got the chambers from Hillsborough, Manatee, Sarasota, Charlotte, Lee, Collier, Broward, Dade and so forth. And we got the legislative delegation and we got the press all working together and we never stopped working until that road got built. All right. Um, now on to Marianne Carroll, who was a very interesting person. She's also passed on. She was the only female uh, among the Florida Highwaymen painters. And she was one of the first people I talked to. I drove to Fort Pierce and talked to her in 2007. I met Harold Newton by the road in Fort Pierce. He was one of the first highwaymen. It was his car that attracted my eye. There were flames painted on it. He did that for attention. He told, me, he told me what he did and he showed me his paintings in the back seat. I watched him paint. He wasn't my teacher though. He showed me how to mix oils, but when I was a child, I could already draw anything I saw. Then I started going on the road with the guys. I was probably 18 when I saw my first painting. My husband left me and the kids when the youngest was five. So I had seven children to raise and I had to have money. They had to eat. They had to have a place to sleep. They had to have clothes. I had to provide. I had seven kids to raise as a single parent. I would do, I would do at least two 24 by 36 inch paintings a day. It was hard work straight through. An 18 by 24 would sell for about $18. A 24 by 36 for 35. A 12 by 24 was 12.50. People commission me now and the price depends on what they want me to do. These landscapes are true Florida scenes and a lot of these things I paint, you don't see anymore. Treasures are being destroyed. That's why I like painting landscapes. It's like painting history. It actually kind of breaks my heart to think that things, things that aren't here or think, to think about the things that aren't here anymore. I look across the street from my house and I see houses where I used to see trees. What I'm gonna do by the grace of God sometime soon is I'm gonna paint that scene, but I'm gonna take all those houses out of there and I'm gonna bring back the trees. Okay, Carlton Ward is next. 
he is a wildlife photographer and he's 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 best known for his work in creating the uh, florida wildlife corridor which is seeking to protect our interior spaces of florida um, from essentially development and, and being spoiled florida is not like colorado where you can look and see the rocky mountains and know that the smelt, the snow melt is a source of a source of your water, and those high, beautiful places are where wildlife can still roam. We have an amazing wild interior that is the source of almost all of our drinking water. It's the source of our one hundred billion dollar agriculture economy. It's where all of our wildlife, in any significant scale, can still survive. But it's hiding in plain sight. We have to treat these vast wild spaces as our sacred mountains that are the source of our life and economy. There's no doubt that Florida is an eclectic and weird place, but I think that gets amplified, amplified, amplified further in the media. And that is a challenge. If we wanna foster a true sense of place and identity rooted in the real Florida, we have to overcome a lot of stereotypes. I feel like there's a tendency to, to portray the world of a land remembered as if it's in the distant past. But in fact, that world still exists in Florida today. You go out on a cattle ranch with a fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth generation cattle rancher whose family has been working and managing the same land for in some cases, two centuries. And you'll see that the Florida frontier still exists, but it needs our appreciation to continue to exist. I have such awe and respect for the people who every morning before dawn saddle up their horses and coil up their lariats and whips and ride out to work the herds. They are almost like knights out there because of their commitment and connection to the land. They ensure that those lands still serve as habitats for wildlife and remain the watersheds that we all benefit from downstream. <clears throat> those cowboys and ranchers are heroes to me and for what they're doing for our state. The Florida Wildlife Corridor Project is a life's work. I hope to spend the foreseeable future of my career on this, telling the stories of the corridor. I wanna be able to, in 30 years, take my daughter to revisit some of the places we visited on our expeditions and, and have those places still be there. Uh, Bill, ha Bill Haas is next. And I will, I'll, I'll start going faster. Uh, it took me about a year of phone calls and emails to finally get Bill Haas to talk to me. Uh, he was 97 when we met where he lived in uh, Punta Gorda, although he was best known for running the uh, Miami Serpentarium. Uh, he was a very serious uh, researcher, but um, he's, he's, he's best known for as a snake handler um, and running that attraction. Four years ago, I got bit by a Malaysian pit viper and that was the end of my right index finger. The bone just dissolved. Most of my fingers were pretty bad anyway from all the bites, but when that finger went, that was the end. I couldn't trust my hands anymore. I tried to hold snakes after that, but I couldn't. The FDA always poo-pooed it, but I think snake venom has the potential to cure disease. Multiple, sc multiple sclerosis, it would put on hold. Arthritis, polio, this is my unfinished business. I've been bit more than 170 times and maybe almost died 20 or 25 times. I don't count the little bites. The initial bite is no worse than a bee sting, but when there's tissue, tissue damage, it feels like your hand is caught in a vice. There have been times I've been rolling on the floor. Many times doctors would transfuse my blood into someone bitten by a snake. It worked too so long as the blood type was a match. I have built up such an immunity to snake venom. Occasionally, my wife would give me a shot of snake venom, just a little bit. It burns when it goes in. I think without fail, it'll help me make 100 easy. I think what it might do, and I don't have any proof, is it makes the heart function stronger and longer. 
And he actually did live to, to 100. <clears throat> My slogan when I first started the Serpentarium was Venom Production for Venom Research. The attraction was just a vehicle for the research. It was the only way I could make money to support the work. The attraction grew and grew. Being in front of people wasn't particularly fun for me. I wanted to be in the lab, but it was, but it was the chore that had to be done. And uh, the Serpentarium had a disaster that happened at one point. The boy that fell in the pit, that was rough. It happened in 1977. He was six. I remember I was in the lab doing something and one of the employees comes running in and said a person fell into the crocodile pit. I remember running. I jumped over the wall and on the crocodile's head. He was partially submerged. I was expecting him to let go, but he didn't. He backed up in the water and took the child with him. I was up all night. What shall I do? What shall I do? I debated with myself. The crocodile only did what he knew to do. What should I do? I shot him and buried him in the pit next to, the, next to a monument. That was the time I considered closing the Serpentarium. All right. Next up is Bud Adams, who is an old rancher, who was also passed on. Um, somebody else like Carlton Ward, who really has a lot of respect for the land. He also has a lot of history behind him too. My father's father was an orphan of the Civil War. Raised up under Reconstruction, he was never taught to read or write and never learned to sign his name, but he became chairman of the Walton County School Board. He sent my father to the University of Florida. All the other boys, he'd give them 40 acres and a mule and start them farming, but my father didn't want that. My father studied law and became the first University of Florida graduate to, graduate to serve in the Florida Supreme Court. My granddaughter has been working with the state to put conservation easements on our land. So future generations of my family or anybody else who acquires the land can never build on it or change it. At my age, that's my priority, to protect the land, to protect the grass, trees, and animals, and to protect our future food supply. <clears throat> Florida is a highly desirable part of the world to live in. It's growing very, very fast. If you do not protect the land as your source of, source of food and clean water and clean air, you're making a big mistake. My father never did encourage me to practice law or study law. He could tell I had an interest in the land. Even at age 10 or 11 years old, I could comprehend you have a, you have a cow, she has a calf, you sell the calf and get money. I just couldn't quite compre comprehend how lawyers made their money because they didn't really produce anything or sell anything. Our land is wonderful habitat for cattle and everything else. Every time you go out, you'll see something a little different, a large alligator, a big buck, a wild turkey, all kinds of birds. These wild animals, they have to have a complete ecosystem. Breaking up the land in small tracks, you break up their way of life. You come back here 50 years from now, you'll still see cowboys and horses and cattle right on this very land. That's my hope. And I will end with alligator Ron Bergeron, who um, one of my favorite people I've met. Um, he's, a, he's a real character. He's an, he's an alligator wrestler, and he's somehow able to balance the fact that he's a developer, but he's also an environmentalist. <clears throat> Here's a little bit from Ron. Yes, I wrestle alligators. It's a Florida cultural thing, sort of like running with the bulls in Spain or fighting bulls in Mexico. That's because years ago, people ate alligators. So they would wrestle them, tie them up and keep them. They didn't have refrigeration. So when they were ready to eat them, they'd eat them. That's how the culture started. I actually lived in a house trailer until I was 41 years old and I was a multimillionaire at 25. Success was never about what it would buy me. Success is about achieving. Florida had cattle many decades, probably 80 years before we, the West did. In the 1500s, when the Spaniards landed on the West Coast of Florida, some of their horses and cattle got loose, entered into the Everglades, 
and acclimated to the environment and multiplied by millions. So Florida had the, America's first cow, first horse, and first cowboy. My grandfather took me on my first airboat, airboat ride when I was three. I can still remember the way it felt, seeing the Everglades of God's creation, the wildlife, the smells, the sunset. My grandfather introduced me to a beautiful world and I fell in love with it. I have a natural resort in the Big Cypress and I let charities auction it off for people to spend the weekend with me. I introduced them to the beautiful Everglades. I always tell them, if you want me to wrestle an alligator, I'll wrestle one. So this one group, very prominent people asked me, and I went in the water and started to wrestle one. And I missed his mouth. I'm on his back, and he had and he wrapped his tail around my left leg and death rolled me with me on his back. He's biting at my ears, but he can't get me. We're just going around and around and around and up and down. He twisted around and got my hand at his mouth. Two two thousand pounds of pressure per square square inch. My audience thought this was part of the show. They were actually clapping when all this was going on. I had to use a technique of going his way, go to the bottom, because that's where they want to bring you. They'll calm down because they think they got you. And he did calm down. I'm lying on the bottom of the lake, and I had to trick him into biting the other hand, and he went for it. He opened his mouth, and I got my other hand out. Then I brought him to my stomach, and buddy, I could have whipped Superman's butt ass. <laughs> my, adren my adrenaline was pumping so much. I kicked my way to four feet of water, stood up, got his mouth shut, and laid him on the shoreline. I said to the group, come on, let's take a few pictures, and then I'm going to go to the hospital to get my fingers sewed back on. Um, my family on my mother's side entered Florida in the 1840s. So let's see, great, great, then a great, then a grandmother, mother, and me. I'm a fifth generation Floridian, and I have children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. So that's eight generations of Floridians in my family. Um, I'll end with this one. This kind of shows how things have changed. I went to Davie Elementary School, the oldest school in Broward County. It was built in 1917. You know how when things happen now, they lock the school down? Well, we had a panther sighting and I'll never forget this. I was in the first grade and they didn't lock the school down. They let us go outside and look for the panther. So that's it. And um, I, it, it's always hard to get me to stop reading these and not reading all the quotes. But um, thanks for bearing with me, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Great. If anyone has any questions, make sure to add them in the Q&A box or in chat. Um, while you're typing, I had a question. OK. Who was your first interview? My, my first one um, for the icon feature was uh, in Ybor City uh, in Tampa. It was uh, Ferdy Pacheco, who was the, um, he was the fight doctor uh, who worked with Muhammad Ali. And, and uh, he was uh, Muhammad Ali's ringside doctor for many years. And uh, Ferdy Pacheco was great. He's uh, not just a doctor, but he was an artist, a writer. Uh, he was a really interesting guy. In fact, the book is divided up into categories of people. And he's the only one that's listed as all the above. <laughs> Great. Anyone else have any questions? If not, I have one more. Okay. <laughs> uh, so what's, what's the secret to a great interview? How do you, how do you start that process? Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a couple things that I use. First of all, uh, you spend a lot of time. If, if, if you have the time, spend a lot of time researching the person you're going to talk to. So uh, that, that really helps develop some, some good questions. But um, one of the most important things that I've found over the years is um, not just asking good questions and being persistent, 
and sometimes having to ask the same questions multiple times to get us an, an, an answer that 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 uh, sort of answers the question but i i tape all my interviews so listening back to the interviews one of the things that's took some time to learn is listening and not interrupting so when someone's talking even if there's a you know they're talking and that maybe there's a little bit of a pause you know don't 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 fill that pause wait for them to fill the pause and a lot of times you get good stuff like that um so so being patient don't interrupt and don't be afraid of long pauses those are all great suggestions i'm remembering these <laughs> um we have a question uh from sylvia okay. and she wants to know if there's a common thread besides florida that runs through all the interviews yeah um not not really although a lot of them talk about uh a lot of them talk about hard work um and when we talk about current events, you know, that's that's always part of the interview, their thoughts about what's going on in Florida these days. A great deal of them talk about the environment, especially their concerns over water uh, and preserving, um, you know, our environment. A lot of people do that. Um, a lot of people say bad things about Tallahassee, um, about politics in our state. Um, but probably most of them are hardworking people. So that becomes a theme too of, of hard work. And we have a question from Pamela. I'm not okay. sure if you'll be able to answer it. Okay. But if not, Pamela, I can probably find out the answer for you. Okay. Are there ghost orchids in the Naples Botanical Gardens? Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think they're so rare. In fact, that that book, The Orchid Thief, was written about people, you know, who 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 go into the strand and poach them. Um, so if anybody does do that, they're not going to show them off in Naples. They're going to take them probably to a different, a whole different place in a private collection. So, um, but yeah, you should you should, we should ask the Naples Garden, which is a, I've I've been there. It's a fantastic garden. Um, but I do not think they have a ghost orchid there. All right. You, your next book is on public gardens, right? That's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on a book now about, about uh, Florida's public gardens. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. ghost orchids in those either, right? <laughs> no, no. In fact, probably the nearest place that you might see a, a, a really rare orchid like that is Selby Gardens in Sarasota. Has lots of, but I do not think that they have a ghost orchid either. They're really, really rare and they're very protected. Yeah. One of our participants said that uh, there are some available to see right now at the Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, Ooh. right up the yeah. road. Yeah, that's a good place too. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, I don't see any other questions. Um, so I just wanna thank Art and thank everyone who's listening. It was a wonderful way to start the evening, learning something new. Um, so until next time. Well, thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.